Hey, I'm Tony Schaefer, the president of the London Center for Policy Research. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of uh, Thought to Action, the Kyle Rittenhouse acquittal. So uh, if you like uh, our content, please uh, share, subscribe, be sure and uh, click that notification bell. Check us out on all our social media, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, we also are available, our content's available on Rumble and other outlets. Uh, without further ado, to get right to why we're here, uh, I'm joined today uh, by our distinguished members of the London Center to go through this. Uh, we've got uh, uh, we, uh, Tim Wilson, senior fellow, lieutenant colonel, retired in the British military, a distinguished fellow, uh, Navy captain, retired Pete O'Brien, and by our senior fellow, Bill Heinzelman, uh, Marine Corps, former Marine Corps. Bill, are you retired or, or former or both? Former. Well, former. never former, right? Got out. I'm trying to figure out what the best term is for Marine Corps guys who still are Marine Corps loyal, but didn't retire. So is that? So once a Marine, always a Marine, right? Once a Marine, always so a Marine. That's say, good. So we'll leave that in there. Once a Marine, out. always a Marine. As Bill says, once a Marine, always a Marine. So here we go. So we're going to go through and, 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 and go through three issues today regarding the acquittal. First, uh, I want to go through the policy. One of the things London Center has been working on our Second Amendment project are two key concepts. First is the concept of MSR, the idea of minimum standard response. And my judgment uh, as a president, I guess I can say that, is that uh, Kyle actually exercised what I believe to be the example, the necessary example going forward of minimum, minimum standard response. And that, that the, the minimum standard of response adequate to defeat a threat was carried out by him with precision. So I, I'd like to go through that today with our panel. Uh, next, I wanna go through kind of the, uh, the, uh, the basic decorum that was exhibited in the legality, which released, relates to our other belief, our other core belief regarding the second amendment is, is should have to carry anywhere they uh, Kyle, was accused of chasing, of, of crossing state lines with the weapon, which he did not. But we should talk about that because well, our belief is, is that uh, no matter where you are, your Second Amendment right of, of self-defense should go with you. So we'll talk about that in, in context to the, the antics of, of uh, Assistant DA Binger and uh, the whole charade. And then lastly, the media. Uh, I want to go through with our panel and talk about what happened regarding the issues relating to um, MSNBC, who got caught trying to do uh, essentially jury, jury intimidation day before yesterday, and the, the overall coverage from the beginning of uh, the misportrayal of Kyle as a, an aggressor, as a white supremacist, uh, and some other things which uh, were fundamentally never uh, true, but they were promoted anyway. So let's, let's start with uh, the first thing, the policy. Uh, I believe that the acquittal show, demonstrates, first off, that uh, the right to carry a weapon is individual, uh, that the right of an individual to defend themselves uh, did, in the end, uh, overcome all the obstacles presented by the left and the prosecutor, which are pretty much one of the same in this case. And let's start with Tim. Tim, you've been our lead on this. Kind of go through and give us your thoughts on uh, on the outcome of, of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, trial. So go ahead, please. I firmly believe that justice prevailed today. Uh, it was good to see the system in operation. You're absolutely right. The media has been a disgrace in convicting Kyle Rittenhouse as best they could in the court of public opinion, even as the event was going on. And for those of us that were really interested, we were watching not watching as much of it as we could live. I actually did see parts of the Rittenhouse video being presented the same evening that it happened, um, and then went into as much detail as I could to see what had happened and how it had happened. Because none of us, as responsible supporters of the Second Amendment, want to see guns being used for murder. But what we are approaching is a system in which various opponents of the Second Amendment see any use for any reason of a gun as a crime. 
And when somebody else dies as a result of that, to them, it is murder. It wasn't. Carl Rittenhouse did not commit murder. That is now the decision of a jury of 12 good and true Americans. Carl Rittenhouse clearly defended himself. And as you said, Tony, he actually did it in a very contained manner. Um, anybody who served in the military would know that in close quarter combat, your automatic reaction is to put as many rounds down as you need to, to get rid of the threat. Rittenhouse actually fired a relatively minimal number of shots. And in one case, he only fired the one shot, despite the, guy, the fact that the guy had a gun pointing towards his head, he fired one shot, disarmed him, and that was enough for Rittenhouse. Um, that is not the actions of a white supremacist. That is not the actions of a gun-happy, gung-ho fool. That was extremely well done. Um, well, Tim, really Tim, on that point, uh, one of the things that we've talked about, uh, and I mentioned in passing, I didn't give it the, the correct title, was Second Amendment uh, uh, suffrage, Second Amendment yeah. uh, sovereignty. So yeah. it's very clear, as you're outlining your thoughts on this, Fundamentally, he had the right to be armed, uh, and I think that's a, a key factor which the, the the prosecution attacked. They basically said they tried to use this as a as a reason to convict. The moment you show up to chaos yep. armed, you lose the right to defend yourself. C could you talk about that a little bit? Because that sounds pretty crazy to me. It, it it's insane because the Second Amendment, in its basic written form, and if you study the history surrounding it of why and how it was introduced going right back to Magna Carta days almost under King John in Britain and the right of people to bear arms. Every American citizen under the Second Amendment has the right to keep and bear arms. It is not restricted in any way. And that should mean any um, American who retains the right through not committing criminal acts should have the right to keep and bear arms anywhere in this nation of ours. It's not restricted by state, it's not restricted by city, it's not restricted by anything. The Constitution is completely clear on this. I would love to get the views of the other two on this, though. Yeah, so Pete, I'd like to get, start with you next. Uh, kind of go through your thoughts, both on the minimum standard response and the, the sovereignty issue regarding the, the right of an individual to be armed wherever he or she the, the, the minimum standard response issue that I think uh, I'd like to touch on here, uh, the facet of it, is that um, it's, it is very easy uh, to sit back and stare at, uh, at a problem in video and, and think that uh, you understand it and that you could contain it uh, at a much lower level of, of if you will, violence uh, than the fellows uh, in the video. Um, Video is horribly deceiving. Uh, and, if you, and if you don't understand that, I'll use this one example. The folks who were sitting watching the video of that SUV, that white SUV in Kabul a couple of months ago, the worker bees, the major, the sergeant major, the, the, the petty officer first class, whatever, the kids who were actually working the problem believed they understood what they were looking at. Absolutely, they believed they understood what they were looking at, and yet they did not. And there are folks who look at that stuff all day long. Now, there's a whole bunch of other issues involved with that, but my point is, is what you think you see on a screen in front of you is not what the person on the other end of that picture is experiencing, it just isn't. And this is always one of these things that, that uh, those of us who, who have found ourselves in these bizarre situations, uh, you'll find yourself uh, invariably and in inevitably, you'll find yourself sitting there talking to uh, somebody who is 5,000 miles away from an event who thinks they understood what happened. They don't. And, and that's one of the, the, the issues that uh, a courtroom sorts out is to try and explain the situation to the 12 jurors. Uh, try to make them understand what in fact really happened, not simply what it looks like happened on a broad screen TV sitting in front of you. Because 
because you cannot appreciate what really happens when a round goes by your head. It's a, a uh, it's an interesting situation, but it is not translatable into um, uh, a, a video game uh, as you're watching TV. And so there is that that first issue is that uh, from from that perspective, this this idea that uh, the minimum standard response has to be something that people can can get their hands around, and the only way you're going to get that hands around the hand around that is to uh, really sit down and pull it apart. And, and the jury did, and the jury's answer was uh, clearly um, that in no case, and none of the five charges that were leveled against him, did the prosecution prove uh, to anybody's satisfaction. So you got five, 12 jurors looking at five different cases at 60 votes. All 60 votes came out that the prosecution didn't prove guilt. So you know that's a, that's a fairly convincing uh, uh, score, if you will. Uh, All right. Well, Pete, thing, on that point, I, I want to talk sorry. more about the video issue on our second round when we go through that. But to your point, uh, it's very clear that uh, the, the prosecution saw that video, the very kind of chaos caused by video and not being there was right. was their lead to create the doubt uh, of Rittenhouse's defense of rightful defense of self-defense because because they kept saying, oh, no, no, he brandished his weapon he basically raised it right. and used it in a threatening way which which they i think that's why they gave it to the jury they gave that really grainy one to the defense so that there was a doubt and they right. and it was only their stupid mistake saying oh oh our video is better than theirs that really got them caught but i think that right. helped illustrate the very thing you're talking about so i just didn't mean to interrupt but i just want to no, no. point out no, 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 i'll, I'll be really quick because i know bill want, wants to come in too but but on the issue of uh jurisdictions and, and uh rights uh, varying from, from state to state, I, I would simply ask any of our listeners this simple question. Does your First Amendment right to free speech vary from state to state? You step over the line into North Carolina, into Tennessee, does somehow your, your First Amendment right vary? Does your Fifth Amendment or, or uh, Fourth Amendment rights vary? Do your Sixth Amendment rights vary? No. The answer is, is absolutely not. Uh, there were a couple of famous court cases to, to address that very thing in the, in the past uh, in this country. None of those other rights are restricted as you cross the, cross the state, state line. But somehow uh, we have allowed the Second Amendment to be kind of torturously twisted around to suit uh, uh, specific uh, desires. And, and I would point out something that, that my friend Tim points out uh, regularly. That twisting of the Second Amendment was something that took place in order uh, to in in the South in order to keep blacks from getting uh, firearms. That that is a that is a well documented uh, uh, fact, and uh, it's it's time that we we peel that back and and stop doing that. That we make that that right available to all. I think that's a key point and something the left doesn't like being reminded of is that fundamentally all gun control can be traced back to the, the left, uh, the progressive left, or otherwise known as the KKK back in the day, and trying to prevent uh, the legal gun ownership by minorities. So we, should, we will continue to talk about that more. Bill, I know you want to get into this, Bill. Please go ahead with your thoughts regarding uh, the two issues we're talking about regarding the outcome of the verdict. Sure. First, I'd just say, I'd echo what Tim said. Um, this is a great day for, this is a good day for justice in America. And I think a couple of things, um, sort of generally speaking, it's, it's real evidence that our system works, even though there's some flaws, some real obvious flaws, right? And some real obvious mistakes of lessons we should have already learned from um, were made in this case, right? Um, but it still worked, right? Uh, so that's encouraging. Um, as far as minimum standard response, one, I think, it's, I think it's unreasonable for any government to expect law-abiding Americans not to stand up for their communities and not to protect their communities against criminals. I think it's absolutely unreasonable. So as far as a minimum standard response goes, I think it's, I think it's unreasonable to ask law-abiding Americans um, to wait if, if they're if they're in possession of a firearm legally to wait until somebody starts shooting at them to return fire 
I think that that is incredibly unreasonable, and it seems as though that's kind of what the expectation may have been. And that's just absolutely irrational, in my opinion, and, and unreasonable. Um, well, Bill, on that point, one of the things Bringer I, said is that, uh, well, guy, he was only threatening with a pistol. What's the big deal with that? Right. So, I mean, yeah. exactly. Yeah, right. I mean, Tony, you know, I, it's like, okay, I, you know, ha- having some experience and, in, in, you know, to Pete's comment about having a round whiz by your head, right? Like, it's unreasonable. It's just, it's unreasonable and irrational to set that as any kind of an expectation for the citizenry. So, you know, God bless our judicial system today. Um, yeah. um, can I just on- jump in quickly, Bill, and just say, you're exactly right. The assistant district attorney's handling of the weapon, his knowledge of firearms, his belief that, yeah, Rittenhouse should have let somebody shoot at him before he returned fire, shows a staggering level of ignorance, and also ignorance by a man who has never been in a position of extreme risk, a man who has never bothered to even pretend to go out with, I would guess he's never been out on patrol with the cops that he's supposed to be supporting. And, and not to defame this this guy too much, because I don't know who this prosecutor, I don't know him, right? No, our, our next but round is know, defaming him. Okay, all right, well, I'll say like, the guy's earned a law degree. He's, he's found his way into this position. He's probably perceived to be maybe I'll save some of this for the next part of it. Like he's probably perceived to be intelligent, right? So it's real dangerous when you have someone who's perceived to be an intelligent expert in something like law, right? Who's obviously showing absolute ignorance around firearms. You have this person who's perceived to be intelligent and is going to know a couple of things, like he's an expert in the law. And then somehow, some way, he knows absolutely nothing. I mean, there's an, there's an absolution of that ignorance. If you don't know your weapon safety rules, like that's the first thing that's ground zero for any familiarity with firearms. So it's, it's, it's an absolute level of ignorance. This guy knows nothing about it. And that was showcased for every American to see in, the, in that courtroom. Um, to, jumping to the second, to the second point, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm a believer in constitutional carry. I think there should be reciprocity and not being an expert in state law and things like that. I, I would just say my general sort of feeling on, I, I think states need to own that. I think governors need to start standing up for their states a little better and governors generally need to just take back ownership of their states from, um, from the federal government. And I think they should stand up, uh, for their the sovereignty of other states. Can I jump in on that one and just point out that in some cases, in quite a, the, the, the momentum has moved towards constitutional carry in more states over time, over the last few decades in particular. Now the real problem, the biggest problem of the lot is that even in some states where concealed carry and constitutional carry is allowed, they have cities that are an exception. I use my own example a lot. I have a New York state concealed carry permit, yet I am not legally allowed to carry into the five boroughs of Manhattan. That is insane. Like where you want to carry most, right, Tim? Exactly. 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 And that's where <laughs> yeah, self-defense crazy. comes in. It is the right of everybody. Every human being has an innate natural right to self-defense. Nobody can say you should allow somebody to attack you, hurt you in any way. And yet what this prosecutor was saying effectively was, Rittenhouse, you should have been hurt, then I'd have more sympathy for you. That's The man, as you say, Bill, expressed a level of ignorance, which actually to me demonstrated how, although he may be intelligent, he is ignorant of of his own ignorance. Precisely, absolutely, like to an absolution, right? I mean, and well, let's I go to the next round of uh, discussion. Just quickly, I would yeah. encourage on, on the minimum standard of response. We have put onto our website at londoncenter.org the minimum standard response table in which we go through the various scenarios in which you're defending yourself. 
And I would point out also that there's a related case which is very important to this. We had six months of riots and then we had the McCloskey affair and uh, in St. Louis. And that was, that was really good from my perspective in terms of the prosecution should never have happened. But the bottom line is two armed citizens defended themselves without firing a shot against a mob, and it was a mob, of several hundred people. And then we go on to the Rittenhouse case where that was the mob that we had already seen for six months not being arrested by the authorities, not being harassed by the authorities, particularly in Portland in particular, but in many other cities, Seattle, um, San Francisco, LA, you name it, it was going on. The right of self-defense is vitally important. And the difference was that with Rittenhouse, they were trying to kill him. There is no question about that. Well, the principal uh, effective use of force during the Cold War was deterrence. And you just outlined exactly what, the, what they did uh, to defend their property in St. Louis is that uh, there was a reasonable expectation of, of use of deadly force if you did something to damage the individuals or property. And I think that's a valid uh, uh, element that people need to understand. And arguably, if you didn't have people who are completely psychotic, uh, who engaged uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, two of them are dead. Uh, I think that th that uh, that would have uh, the deterrent thing should have worked. And obviously, when deterrents fail, uh, there needs to be credible force behind it. So I believe that's all part of the spectrum of, of minimum standard response. A minimum standard response, to you, as you point out, Tim, can be the weapon is observed and someone does not want to engage. I think that's a, a very good uh, engagement regarding the, the minimum standard response. The response is I'm armed. And I'm not going to do a darn thing if you leave me alone, right? I, that, that's, I think, a, a standard issue, but something we need to talk about. So that leads me to the next point. Our next round is the prosecution basically said uh, in every aspect of their opening, their questioning, their closing, that the minimum standard response should not exist. That basically, a, 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 in the prosecution's view, a law-abiding citizen is one who does not uh, show up armed, who does not engage, who basically has to be a victim. That's, that's their answer. It's like, uh, car, you know, what did they say? Everybody takes a beating sometime. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what country they live in, but that's not America. That's not the America <laughs> I know. So, but, uh, so let's start with that. The prosecutorial malfeasance, uh, uh, the complete departure uh, of, of any uh, monicum of, of uh, con constitutionally based standards uh, people take a beating. You, you, it's only a, a, a pistol. Why are you worried? Um, uh, there was no, uh, there was no reason for you to be armed that night. The very fact you were armed removed your defense, your right of defense. These are all, oh, oh, you didn't say anything to the police. You, you know, you, you decided to, to use your fifth amendment, right? What, what's wrong with you? So, Let's go through that a little bit. Tim, what do you make of what should happen to Binger? I don't, and by the way, uh, ignorance is not an excuse in, front, in the eyes of the law, him being stupid. So let's start with that, Tim, and go around. Um, ignorance is also um, not a defense in a lawyer who, is not, who obviously hadn't bothered to research and learn about firearms. Um, Ignorance is not a defense in a lawyer who had obviously never been out on patrol with the cops himself to realize what threat they're under. Ignorance is not a defense when you don't understand the Constitution of the United States of America. And ignorance is having an opinion which you believe is more valuable than the law or the Constitution. That's a great uh, perspective. One that I think uh, we need to be more, I guess, uh, uh, calling for accountability. So that's my question to Pete. Pete, what do you, what, if you were uh, in the Wisconsin Supreme Court, what would you do to bring her, if anything, regarding his uh, obvious challenges with the way he presented the, the prosecution? Well, I, I, would, I would start 
with reminding him that the Supreme Court has had, the U.S. Supreme Court has had, uh, has, has passed uh, several uh, decisions, one just, uh, I want to say three years ago, um, in which they overwhelmingly reaffirmed the position. This is a position that's been held by the courts for a long time, hundreds of, uh, you know, by our, by our Supreme Court, basically since, since the beginning of, of uh, its first consideration of these kind of matters, uh, but but has been reaffirmed repeatedly, is that you are responsible for your own safety. You, no one else. The police cannot be held accountable if they fail to protect you. And the specifics of uh, the one case, I want to say it's from the early 80s that is used all the time now, is quoted all the time, uh, is are horrific. Uh, in, this, in their specifics, in the specifics. A, a woman was um, being attacked. This is in Washington, DC. A woman was being attacked. Um, and there was a phone call from the apart next apartment saying a woman's being attacked, she's being raped. Uh, the police came, they wandered around the outside of the building while there was screaming going on from inside the building. They couldn't get in. No one came to answer the door, they left. And the woman was brutalized and raped. And uh, so a, a suit was brought against the police saying, hey, you should have done something. And, this, and it ran, ran all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, no, not the police's job. It is not the police's job to protect you individually and specifically. That's your job. And in the latest uh, uh, decision that the court came down, and I want to say it came down as a, it was an 8-0 decision, but don't hold me to that. Uh, the court specifically said that it is not only not the police's job, they specifically said it is your job. They use the, those words. It is your responsibility to defend yourself and no one else's. And, and so before yeah. you go any further, before the, anybody thought, you know, moves any further in towards this case, the, the, I, I would submit that the Bar Association uh, out in Kenosha should pull this guy aside and say, hey, pal, read up. Uh, uh, you know, th there are there are innumerable court cases which have pointed specifically at what you're saying doesn't exist or shouldn't exist. So you need to pay attention. Um, it, it, you know, with the, the idea that somehow you're supposed to not defend yourself, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to wait, wait for somebody else to come up. And, and particularly, I would ask him, um, if you're not supposed to defend yourself, is there a provision for defending your family? I would like to. I'd like him to answer that question. Are you supposed to stand aside and let uh, let some guy come into your house and beat the crap out of your wife? Pardon my French. I, I'd I'd like to know what his answer is on that. Yeah. So over to Bill. Bill, uh, you were I think able to detect and pick up on most of the themes that were I think detrimental to the Constitution. But practically speaking. Uh, they attack the very right of, of you or I, as Pete said, to protect our family. What, what would you do to bring her if it was up to you regarding holding him accountable? Yes, what would I do to bring her? <laughs> you know, this, this whole case, this, it's riddled with issues, right? And I, I think the media, as usual, is pretty complicit in that they're not trying to carry this water they're just completely omitting it, right? Like they're just not covering the prosecutor. It seems like I, I'm, I'm not, I don't watch a lot of MSNBC or CNN or, you know, PBS, but I, I don't think uh, they're, I, from what I hear, they're just omitting a lot of the prosecutor's coverage of it. Um, there needs to be an investigation with the haste in which this whole case was put together. I, I mean, this guy was exposed. He's been seen for what he is. The people of Kenosha know him far better than we ever will, right? And I, I think they're going to likely hold him to account because he's an embarrassment to the people of Kenosha, right? I mean, that's who this guy is ultimately representing. Um, and I'm sure all those good folks in Kenosha are like, this guy has been exposed. We know who he is now. We know why we didn't vote for him when he ran for public office as a Democrat. And He's obviously got some kind of weird um, ambition and he's willing to completely, you know, uh, try to see what he could get away with is what it, 
it almost seemed like. like he's more he concerned about what the, the politics, woke mo- Bill. He's more concerned about yep. politics than he is about the law, which for a lawyer, yep. especially a prosecutor, is disgraceful behavior. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think, I think um, you know, the good people of Kenosha be him. I think that I would expect that they see him and they know better, regardless of whatever the country is going to talk about and, and, you know, likely argue over and, you know, really argue over. The people at Kenosha know who that guy is now and yeah. um, he's exposed. So, you know, he's not, he's not going to be able to go anywhere. Everybody's going to know who he is now, but he's definitely not going to get anywhere in Kenosha, I don't think. Um, so that's. Well, that's a good answer, and I think uh, this leads it to the to the next and final uh, round of discussion, which is the media, because this guy Ringer played to the media. He was, you point out, he was doing something. He had a great audience. Uh, you know, all the world is an audience, and and we're but players. And he made that point over and over. But let's look at root causes here. The only reason we're talking about Binger, and the only reason Binger actually prosecuted uh, Rittenhouse, was because the media lied. Uh, about what had happened in Kenosha the night before Rittenhouse had to defend himself. Essentially, the police engaged what later was was confirmed to be a lawful shooting of an individual. The individual was shot in the back. That was the big deal. You know, well, he had already uh, attacked law enforcement and he was getting ready to attack someone else. So therefore, lethal force was justified. But it wasn't portrayed that way by the media, thereby fanning the flames of, of racist hate and misconceptions relating to all of the issues that we're talking about. So uh, the media has been benefiting from this whole thing, from the moment they lied about the shooting to the written house events to all through the trial, all the, the falsehoods fuel what allows them to profit from, which is advertising. Uh, uh, one would argue, and I, I've, I've seen people make the argument, that the media actually had a stake in the verdict by the fact they were hoping for a negative verdict, uh, a guilty verdict, so they could get all sorts of traction saying, we told you so. Now that he was found not guilty, they're going to have a, a, a much harder time. As a matter of fact, they're going to want to go away because they're probably going to get sued for some of the outlandish things they said. As a matter of fact, they should. So that's, as a matter of fact, that's where I want to start. So, Tim, uh, what do you believe... Uh, uh, we should think of the role of the media. What what should we do? I'm quite frankly, accountable. Quite and simply, it's been disgusting, as you say, for their own agenda and their own reasons. They they had far more sympathy for the rioters and looters and people who and the killers. Quite frankly, um, there have been a number of people killed throughout the last eighteen months. Uh, in these riots, driven by a variety of reasons. But the media has played the wrong side. They haven't worried about the businesses that were burnt. They haven't made much of the victims of of the the violence that's gone on. Nobody seems in the media seems to have gone back to discover just how bad the results were, although we know that in some cases it takes cities decades to recover. And businesses sometimes are gone forever. People are hurt by it. Unemployment expands. All of that goes on. And this is all the fault of the media. And they do it, as you rightly say, Tony, mostly for profit, although some of it is for their own political agendas. And I think on that one, I would just say this whole defund the police movement was a political, politically driven move grossly exaggerated by the media and some of their people's liking for the concept. Except, if you take away the police, what do you have left to defend yourself, particularly if you are a little old lady somewhere and the 200 pound or 250 pound crack addict comes after your pocketbook? The only thing that works in those cases is a gun. You can't carry a policeman in your pocket, as they say. You and the media hates that concept until they're attacked. And then suddenly, oh boy, it's a different story. Right. 
So, Pete, what do you think? Well, how, how should we approach the uh, holding media accountable for what they clearly helped create? As a matter of fact, I would argue they created this whole situation. Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of different layers to it. I, I'd go back to the, uh, the, the Eagles had a, a great uh, a song about, uh, you know, the, the read, read about it on the, you know, hear about it on the evening news kind of thing, uh, that, that violence always leads, um, violence gives you good ratings. Uh, the media you mean story, Dirty Laundry, Don Henley, it was a great song. Yeah, Don Henley, that's right, Dirty Laundry, right. Um, uh, and, and yet there's a lot of truth to it, uh, unfortunately. Um, the, the, the idea of uh, high drama, lots of violence, uh, look at your average television show. Um, this, so um, I, I, would, I would add that uh, at the same time, there, is, there needs to be some sort of effort here because you've got 90% of the, of the media uh, in this country is reporting from a very narrow slice of the spectrum. Um, and, and that's an issue. Uh, I'm not sure how we get around that. Uh, it, uh, well, let me just jump in and, plead, and, and plead that we don't say we need laws to do something. We need yes. less laws. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Let, let the yeah. free market drive these, a these absolutely scumbags out of business. A a absolutely, yeah. but you have you have uh, there are difficulties associated with that when you have a fellow who's worth uh, you know two hundred billion dollars uh, owns a newspaper. He doesn't care whether it's making profit or not. Um, I understand. That represents an issue. I, I have a thought on this. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. So, I, as weird as this is for me to even say, I feel like the arts are going to save us here, right? I, and this is weird, right? But it's a huge part of our freedoms to express what we're thinking and feeling. And there's all kinds of modems to get that, all kinds of platforms to do that. I don't, nobody has, I don't think anyone has the answer for mainstream media. Right. And the way they're carrying the water and protecting some of our leaders that we don't want them to put like they're, they're just, you know, keeping them from being exposed for who they are. I, it, you know, you mentioned the Eagles. Right. And I think we're starting to see more of that. Um, for instance, the number one late night television show is Gutfeld on Fox. He's beaten like everybody else. His ratings are through the roof. You're starting to see these like artists these rappers and things like that starting to communicate like the let's go buy, let's go brandon guy and he's number one on the pop charts for weeks you know that's that's the that's the that's what's gonna happen i mean i i'm starting to think that that's how it boils up so the key response needs to be we need to just keep america a safe place for people to express their feelings we need to and their thoughts um in, and especially those that are incredibly gifted and more, more talented uh, of, uh, of drawing a, and, and captivating a, a sort of collective audience of the masses. Um, we need to maintain a, a, a place and a platform for those people to educate in another way, on another level, you know, that, if that I other, can jump that Americans are going to consume. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I would, I would, I would add to that is the, the defense of our defense of our fundamental rights, the defense of free speech, the defense of of, of contrarian speech, um, really is is the root of all that. And I think that's what we really need to we, we need to harp on. And 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 a tip of the hat to to the system. Uh, Twelve. 12 jurors sat down and listened uh, to ranting and raving from both sides and they came up with an answer. That's what's supposed to happen. Right. So uh, that's it. Uh, we've gone through the issues. Thank you all for joining us today. I think uh, I'd like you to come back and see us again here at, at, on Thought to Action, where we've done this review of right away, the hot wash review of the, the Rittenhouse acquittal. And just to, for the audience to know, you know, uh, uh, this, is, this is a loaded gun. Uh, it is safe. See, it, it's, it's not hurting anybody uh, by the fact it is a loaded gun and it does not do anything without someone affecting it. So the idea has to be, uh, this is something that you have the right to carry and defend yourself. It's not gonna do anything if it's left alone, right? It's inert. The only time that it should be used is when you're defending yourself, and that's the idea, is safe gun ownership, safe use, so that when a situation arises, uh, you're trained to be effective like Kyle Rittenhouse was, very precise, 
You have the right to have and use the weapon. Make sure that you met all the requirements for safe use. We believe in the London Center that we sh that you should be expanded to anyone who can legally carry a gun, and that gun should be with you anywhere you want to go. So these are fundamental facts, which I think bore out uh, as the right thing in practical use in the Rittenhauer case. So I would encourage you all to come back, to like, share, subscribe, follow us here on uh, Thought to Action uh, and the London Center for Policy Research. And uh, for those who uh, like the content, please join our Patreon, where we have special Ask Us Anything events where you can ask us questions and we get very much into giving you great answers and the people enjoy them. Also, uh, be sure to like, share, subscribe, as I mentioned, uh, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and all the other social media sites. So uh, uh, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, the President of the London Center for Policy Research, and, and thank our panelists today, uh, Bill Henselman, Pete O'Brien, uh, Tim Wilson, for joining us, and we'll see you again real soon on Thought to Action.